Good morning. Welcome back to this ongoing online course on understanding and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and we are focusing on scope 1 and 2 emissions that is reduction through building design and construction. I am your instructor Professor Avloketa Agrawal. I am an associate professor at Department of Architecture and Planning IIT Roorkee. We are in the week 2 of this ongoing course and this is the second lecture of week 2. Now, in this lecture, we are going to quickly understand the mechanisms of Kyoto Protocol. Now, before I go to Kyoto Protocol and we start reading about the mechanisms, let us quickly have a recap of what we did in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we discussed at length about wha what led to the creation of UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was basically to understand that climate change was recognized at the global level, at the United Nations level and almost the entire world came together, agreed, signed the document which is UNFCCC became a party to it and agreed that yes, we need to reduce climate change. How do we do it? Was eventually subsequently it was adopted, various measures were adopted in different conference of parties COPs which we have seen through the history starting with the first one which was Kyoto Protocol. So, when we studied about UNFCCC, we clearly understood that it is kind of an agreement, it is a framework convention where it discusses about what needs to be done and everybody agreed that okay, climate change has to be reversed, reduced, stopped, something has to be done about climate change, but how will it be done was subsequently discussed in different conference of parties and the first and the most important of that being Kyoto Protocol. So, we will quickly read about in this particular lecture, introduction to Kyoto Protocol, different mechanisms of Kyoto Protocol and quick amendments, some amendments and then successor to Kyoto Protocol which we will take in the next lecture tomorrow, third lecture of this week. So, quickly introducing Kyoto Protocol and we have seen it through the history. So, I am not going to take you through the historical events that led to it, but when UNFCCC was proposed and adopted in 1992, which was the first earth summit, five years after that the Kyoto Protocol was adopted in December 1997. And there was a very complex ratification process which was required. Ratification as I have already mentioned in the previous lecture, it requires parties to sign. Parties are the nations which are agreeing to follow the protocol that is in this case Kyoto Protocol and then they will also have, they will also write how and what will they do to achieve this protocol or to meet this protocol and that is what the ratification process was. So, eventually it entered into force in February 2005 when the minimum number of signatories they signed the protocol and finally it came into force. Now, what does protocol, Kyoto Protocol uh, do? It operationalizes the UNFCCC by committing industrialized countries and economies in transition to limit and reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So, that is and that is with their individually agreed targets. So, the targets have to be set by individual party which is what we have seen. So, each party will set some targets of its own, they will bring it to the to the conference of party and they will agree, they will become the signatories. It essentially uh, is based upon the principles and provisions of the UNFCCC. So, it draws from that the parent body remains UNFCCC and it follows its annex based system. So, if you remember we also saw there are several annexes to UNFCCC and the similar, similar structure has been adopted in Kyoto Protocol also. One interesting thing which has in been followed in UNFCCC right from the beginning and all its conference of parties, its protocols and its amendments is that it puts a heavier burden on the developed countries and it has a binding for developed countries and there is hardly any binding for the developing countries and underdeveloped countries. So, the principle of UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol being common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. So, that is why we saw when we were reading about UNFCCC that there are different annexures, Annex A countries, Annex B countries, non-annex countries, LDC countries. So, that is what we saw 
and there the differentiated responsibility and differentiated capabilities has been respected and accordingly binding or non-binding status has been given to that. So, this is just a clip where so Kyoto protocol when it was proposed and gradually it was ratified it has been a successful protocol in terms that there are uh, almost the entire world is a signatory to that, but it is not successful in the in the sense that we have still not been able to achieve what we wanted to achieve through Kyoto protocol. So, if you look at this here and if you remember the different annexes we you can see different annexes. Now, here we can see that the ones which are in green these are the annex B parties with binding targets in the second uh, period. So, Kyoto protocol had two periods 1997 to 2012 and 2012 to 2020 these are the two uh, binding periods. The first binding period after which it was uh, increased amendment was passed in Doha and it was increased uh, to the second period that is what we are talking about as a second period. So, these are the parties which have binding targets in uh, second period these are the parties which had binding targets in the first period, but they did not agree they did not create their own targets for the second period. So, they, they were there only till 2012 with binding targets some countries which initially were there, but then they withdrew from the protocol. So, Canada. So, Canada was earlier a signatory a party to Kyoto protocol, but later it pulled out and then USA did not uh, become a signatory to the prot protocol and uh, uh, they have that has they have not ratified the protocol uh, as yet. These countries which are less developed or are developing countries they are signatory they are party to the Kyoto protocol, but they do not have binding targets. So, they are non binding target uh, parties and so these are all the and uh, I think there are very few which are not party or they have not ratified the protocol so far. Now, if we look at the uh, Kyoto protocol we will see that depending upon the size of the economy and also the status of developed and uh, the status of uh, development the countries have been have been provided they had been provided with binding targets for reducing their uh, their emissions and which is what we have seen here that out of the total goal which was set to 3 percent. However, so it was divided between all the countries only 0.4 percent of the goal has been has been achieved. So, this is what it is uh, showing that what was the target which was set and what has been achieved. So, the target for example, was 14 percent, but none has been achieved. For example, in case of Canada 22 was the target which was set 22 percent reduction and only 6 percent reduction has been uh, achieved. Some, some countries have done really well and some others have not done as well, but overall we are far from achieving the uh, target and if we look at the overall scenario of global emissions since adopting Kyoto protocol and that is where I say that Kyoto protocol has not been a very successful uh, protocol in the sense that the targets which we had kept for ourselves we have not been able to achieve. So, here bigger the circle if you look at this particular graphics bigger the circle implies more is the emission overall uh, emission absolute emission and these triangles clearly tell us that whether the emissions from when they the parties ratified Kyoto protocol. So, the emissions have increased or decreased here we can see that US has since increased its uh, emissions well it is it has not ratified Kyoto protocol, but if you look at China which has non binding targets, but it has ratified uh, the Kyoto protocol has almost increased the total emissions greenhouse gas emissions by 100 percent. So, they have literally doubled the emissions, but then we also see that there are non binding targets for these countries. If we look at so some countries in Europe have done really well for example, UK has reduced their emissions, Germany has reduced their emissions by 6 percent which is a which is a good number. So, we see that Europe has done significantly well as far as uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and meeting their targets is concerned. So, they might have uh, set bigger targets for themselves and they might not have been able to achieve that fully, but overall they have been able to achieve some emission cuts in the, uh, uh, in the overall uh, numbers. If you look at India we have also significantly increased our emissions and this is a period of 1997 to 2007 
when Kyoto Protocol was adopted uh, for the first time and 10 years from there that uh, India has also increased its emissions by 60 percent during that 10 percent uh, 10 years period and we are talking about another 15 years from then to from uh, 2007. So, this is this is what we are seeing as a scenario that the global emissions have only increased overall global emissions have have significantly increased and they have not gone down. Now, we are talking about Kyoto Protocol asking parties the signatories to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, how do they really do that and how does it promote them? When I say as a country for example, I am India, I am representing India and I say that okay, I will achieve a net zero target by 2070 or China says that I will achieve a net zero target by 2060 whatever target uh, targets we set for ourselves. How does Kyoto Protocol enable us? How did it enable countries to achieve those targets? So, there are certain uh, basically the purchasing mechanisms in Kyoto Protocol and they were very flexible. So, it was the success of Kyoto Protocol was through the flexibility mechanisms that it devised. So, we are largely looking at these three market based mechanisms. One is international emissions trading, the other one is clean development mechanisms and joint implementation. When we are talking about international emissions training trading, we are largely looking at carbon trading. So, the uh, emissions which have been saved by one party can be traded as uh, by the other party which is emitting more. So, these were so overall balancing the emissions across the globe is what the idea was. So, we will go over each one of these uh, in detail now. Uh, if we broadly look at Kyoto Protocol, uh, this is under UNFCCC that basically we have two types of uh, mechanisms one is allowance based and the other one is project based. The first one which is uh, international emission trading is allowance based. So, if you are not able to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions you have been allowed to emit more literally by purchasing the credits that somebody else has earned by reducing their emissions. So, this is allowing allowance. So, allowance base is one which is international emissions trading carbon trading. The second uh, type is project based where we have these two one is CDM clean development mechanism and the uh, third one is joint implementation. Let us go over each one of these. So, international emission trading is what happens that when an industrialized country pays to purchase emissions. For example, if I give you a very clear example Bhutan is a carbon negative it is a carbon sink it does not emit it has very low greenhouse gas emissions. But for example, a country like China emits uh, more than what it should. So, what it can really do is that it can purchase the carbon credits from Bhutan which they have earned and there are benchmarks how would one know that I have I have reduced my greenhouse gas emissions from the benchmark the baseline. So, there is a lot of work scientific models which have been uh, developed device on what that that benchmark benchmark is. And if a country like Bhutan reduces its greenhouse gas emissions below that benchmark a country like China can purchase. So, this is an open market trading carbon trading or international emission trading. So, this is one mechanism the second mechanism is clean development mechanism where the industrialized country it invests in an emission reduction project in a developing country. So, they invest and the the credits that are earned by reducing the emissions are credited to the investors emission reductions. So, there this is called certified emission reduction when the industrialized country funds a an emission reduction program in an industrializing or developing country. This is clean development mechanism and the joint uh, implementation mechanism is where an industrialized country funds for a green the greenhouse gas emission project in another industrialized country. So, in that case also the investor gets the benefit and these are called emission reduction units or ERUs. So, these are the three mechanisms in which the uh, flexibility has been provided and uh, the economies the countries can go ahead and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So, how does this emission trading system works? For example, if you look at this, so there is an emitter A, it could be within the countries, it could be across the countries, anywhere. So, 
if you look at the world, the carbon trading, the international emissions uh, trading uh, platforms, several of such trading platforms are there. So, there could be an emitter A and emitter B. This is the, the, the baseline for emit allocated GHG emission units and there are models to determine that. Now, emitter A actually emits more than its allowed GHG emissions and emitter B emits less. So, this is the credit that this emitter has emitter B has earned. These are the units that it has earned and it can sell these units in the carbon market the international emissions through uh, this particular mechanism IET and then it takes it buys the emitter A buys these these credits and the, it will further reduce. So, suppose this is an amount x and here it is an amount y which is less than x. So, we will be able to reduce this emitter A will be able to reduce its emission by this by investing in purchasing the carbon credits. It will have to purchase the remaining amount z from some other emitter or some other source where he can purchase the carbon credits and reduce this entire thing which is the mandate. So, this is what international emissions trading does and by April 2020 there were 23 emissions trading systems. So, there are a lot of uh, emissions trading systems which are working across the globe. So, there are several international systems, national systems. Uh, some are there at regional, provincial or state levels, some are there at the city levels also. So, within the city the carbon trading could be happening. So, cities are being maintained as a as a neutral uh, emitters. So, this has been a successful mechanism and it is it is only growing. So, and the rates uh, at which the carbon is being traded, the emissions are being traded, they are also increasing which clearly implies that there is an increasing demand for purchase and so it is a good time for countries and cities to also invest in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. For, for all emitters it is a good time, it is a good strategy to invest in, uh, in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and earn credits for earn carbon credits in the open market. The Next mechanism flexibility mechanism that Kyoto protocol gave us was clean development mechanism where an industrialized country invests in a developing country for emission reduction program and emission reduction project. So, it is project based and the whole process is same the only thing being that the money that is being invested in a, an emission reduction project is being funded by some developed country into a developing country and here what we are seeing is that we actually have the uh, projects that are being planned to reduce for example, afforestation exercises. Now, a developed country might fund now the developed country might not have enough land uh, within its geographic boundaries to develop a sink project a carbon sink project like uh, afforestation and it funds for example, China again I take the same example China funds afforestation in Bhutan. Now, what, what is uh, it costing Bhutan that it is not industrializing and when there is less industrialization the, the economic growth will be hampered somewhere, but the credits that this uh, small country as, a, as small as Bhutan is earning through carbon trading it can offset the requirement for industrialization itself. So, that is what is happening in the clean development mechanism and in this joint implementation it allows a country with an emission reduction commitment under Kyoto protocol to earn emission reduction units from an emission reduction project in another annex B party or uh, industrialized developed uh, party. Again when we are trading these carbon credits it is equivalent to 1 ton of carbon dioxide emitted or emission saved. So, that is what we are uh, talking about. Now, there are several benefits of this flexible mechanism and th there have been a lot of success stories while I say that it has not been fully successful, but there have been several success stories. One is that it, st it stimulates the green investment in developing countries. Now, developing countries often do not have sufficient funds to invest in uh, such uh, emission reduction programs. But then developed countries have a binding target to reduce their emissions which they cannot do on their own land. 
they cannot change the machinery of complete machinery of their industrialized units or they cannot change the uh, entire energy production system in their country. So, what it can do is that it allows the uh, investment into uh, in emission reduction programs green investment. So, this this is uh, this has been a, a very uh, good benefit of this flexible market mechanism. It includes it brings in the private sector and it helps to cut and hold the greenhouse gas emissions at a very steady and uh, safe level. And overall it helps uh, the industries to skip the older and dirtier technology to a newer and cleaner infrastructure and systems because somebody is funding. So, if the funding becomes easy. So, at the end of the day when we are talking about and we had seen when we were talking about the climate change risks, we had seen that economy risks, risks due to transition, the transition risks are also significant, they are substantial. So, this is where it, it kind of eases, this mechanism eases this transition because the uh, the industry, the country which is in the mode of transition is not the one who is paying. There is somebody else who is paying. So, it is kind of win-win to everybody. And then overall it strengthens the protocols environmental integrity and it supports the carbon markets credibility and ensures transparency of, account, transparency of accounting by parties. Now, Kyoto Protocol originally was supposed to be up till 2012. So, in uh, 2012 there has been an added period that was in Doha, uh, Qatar in 2012 and it uh, adopted for a second commitment period which I was mentioning earlier which started in 2013 and it lasted up till 2020. So, the, the first commitment period was from 2008 to 12, 2007 was when Kyoto Protocol was ra ratified and then uh, the second uh, commitment period started from 2013 after 2012 and then it uh, lasted until uh, 2020. After that also, so in between from adopting Kyoto Protocol, uh, we have already seen in the history when we were talking about UNFCCC, different conference of parties and the major uh, takeaways from those COPs. 2007 Washington Declaration, Cancun Agreement, Doha Amendment of extension uh, of uh, second commitment period and uh, then uh, 2014 finally coming to 2015 Paris Agreement because Kyoto Protocol's period would end in 2020. So, 2015 it was uh, agreed, it emerged that Paris Agreement would be considered or would be the successor of Kyoto Protocol and the mechanisms and the targets, the aims, objectives of Kyoto Protocol will be now handed over to Paris Agreement and from 2020 onwards it will continue to take it forward. So, from 2015 to 2020 this was given as a grace period to develop Paris Agreement and to develop the complete protocol to devise the mechanisms, the process by which more and more parties would be included and that is what we will see in the, in the next lecture. So, this was all about Kyoto Protocol. Thank you very much for joining me today. We will have the third lecture where we will talk about Paris Agreement and again I repeat that here we have come to a consensus where we are talking about the need which the world was recognizing to reduce GHG emissions and hence we now see that GHG emissions which were at the, at the core of this entire problem of unsustainable development and climate change was getting a greater attention and so now the mechanisms have developed to reduce it and also to support economy in a way again in a in a sustainable manner. So, we will look at Paris Agreement in the next lecture of this week, lecture 3 of this week and then we will move forward to the IPCC and GHG protocol subsequently. Thank you very much for joining me in this lecture today. I will see you in the lecture 3 of this week tomorrow. Thank you.